Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Linux Tech and Gaming Show. Tonight, we're down a man. Uh, that way? Yeah. Osiris, he couldn't join us. Uh, weekend, family, you know, all that nonsense. But uh, what we're going to talk about tonight is refresh rates and how I personally think they're going to uh, affect VR. And uh, Sistrum's going to provide his input. 68. Commentary. No. I, I go to this commentary, not so much input, because I don't really care. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that uh, the FERPs are the FERPs, and uh, as long as I don't throw up after 20 minutes of use, I'm, I'm good to go. Well, that is one of the things that I wanted to uh, address. Um, now, first of all, my backstory. After I got rid of my, uh, or didn't get rid of, but transitioned from my 22-inch 1080p monitor to a 32-inch uh, ultra-high-definition monitor, 3840 by 2160, I noticed some, some issues when in-game. There was just a little bit of input lag, some, some like, judder... And it just wasn't the smooth experience I was expecting. And you might think, well, this is because uh, you're not pushing the game at 60 FERPs. Well, no. TF2 is my benchmark. It runs at a solid 60, and if you uncap it, it'll run 120, 130, 140 at 3840 by 2160. And... That, that was on a uh, GTX 780. So, it, the, the game is, is, is running fine. And it's running at a solid 60. But it just doesn't feel right. Now, if I back the uh, monitor down to 1080p and, and run full screen, I still get that problem. But, if I've got the monitor running at native resolution and I play the game in a window... Even as high up as 3200 by 1600, I didn't experience this problem. I can't rule out that it's a problem with the specific monitor that I have, which is the uh, Acer B326HK. This is a 32-inch IPS UHD, and it's got a 6 millisecond response time, which... A little higher than your average TN panels, but for an IPS, that's pretty good. But, uh... The... The, uh... And there goes that thought. Right out the window. I'm just gonna let it come back. But yeah, uh, playing this in a window, even up to 3200 by 1600, I didn't have that problem. And could be the monitor, but I can't rule it out. Now, after that, I, I ran this monitor for about a year. And then I got the 27-inch uh, 2560 by 1440 monitor the ASUS PG279Q. Now this monitor uh, is IPS, and it is a, an IPS refresh of the PG278Q, which was a TN panel with a one millisecond response. This is IPS with a four millisecond response. But the 278Q was a 144 hertz. The 279Q is a 165 hertz monitor when it is fully overclocked and uh, because I've purchased monitor arms I can get both of these monitors right up in my face uh, something I did uh, neglect to mention before was that I had the 4k monitor really it's UHD uh, back about three feet from my face and since I got the monitor arms, I can now put the monitors like one foot away from my face to see 
how this uh, exacerbates the problem. Because my hypothesis here is that how much of your vision is being filled affects how sensitive you are to frame rates if your eyes are sensitive to frame rates, which some people are and some people are not. Now the, uh, the 1440p high refresh rate monitor, even when I've got that, uh, when I've got it dialed down to 60, it will It's a lot less noticeable, even though I have it right up in my face. If I play right at 60 with it up in my face, I can notice the problem, but it's not so bad that it makes me sick, whereas on the uh, UHD monitor, it would make me sick after a while. Perhaps an hour or so of playing. At higher refresh rates, and note, higher refresh rates, but not higher frame rates. If the game is still capping at 60, but I'm, I'm running the monitor at, at its 165 hertz refresh rate, that seems to go away. And I don't know why that would be, being the game is still running at the same uh, frame rate. But that's just an observation that I've found. How this relates to VR is the original developer uh, versions of the Oculus Rift, for example, were 60 Hertz. And now that the HTC Vive and the Oculus Rift are out proper as um, finished products, they're running a 90 Hertz refresh rate because they found that 60 wasn't really good enough. Now, personally, I haven't had any experience with these devices, but I don't think that 90 is going to be enough, at least not for me. And I don't know where the cutoff is really going to be. I'd like to think that maybe 90 is good enough. I don't know if I'll be getting any... Uh, any VR equipment anytime soon, unless it gets Linux support, of course. I can only imagine that I'm personally going to experience headaches using a VR device at 90 uh, hertz refresh rate. And just as a little uh, point of fact, it, you can Google this, there was a test done by the United States Air Force many years ago back in the film days, and they tested how quickly pilots could identify a an image that was only shown for one frame, and they got down to a, as, as little as 1 225th of a second. So one frame out of 225 they showed them an image of a of an enemy aircraft and they were able to identify that that comes about from training as well as uh, natural ability but I'm wondering if that's where we're going to have to go to make it uh, work for the vast majority of people. Well, that's my brain dump. Uh, Sistrum, do you have any, any thoughts on this? Well, I, th I think there's a uh, divergence in, um, in VR as it is anyway, because we've, we've, got, uh, we've got VR both in actual physical headsets, and then we have VR that are based off of like cell phones and stuff. Um, and in comparative to commodity hardware, it really depends on where the hardware is pushed, I, I do have to agree to you that at least 120 hertz would be a bare minimum in my opinion if you're having something so close to your face. If it's farther away, like a 40 inch screen for me should be, you know, four to five feet away from me, if not my entire equivalency of height. 
it should be, you know, a good distance. Because I found that the closer that a 4K display is, or the closer that a 1080p display is to my face, the larger amount of pixel pixelization, I guess you would call it, that I can see in the image, and it just bothers me. Especially, like, if I'm watching a movie and I can see, like, specs in the movie, it just, it annoys me. So, for me, if, if I'm wanting something that I'm going to interact and stuff like that for video games and stuff, uh, on a level for me, because I am blind, basically, I wouldn't say blind, but I, because of issues with, with my eyesight... I still stick with 1920 by 1080 because then I can read everything on the screen at a decent distance. I don't exceed, you know, I have a, like a 27 inch monitor. I've got multiple of them, plus I've got, you know, the 23 inch monitor back here. That's also 1920 by 1080. Um, and I myself preferably have noticed that the higher the refresh rate, if I'm playing games or doing something active or doing something specific, I see less screen tearing and stuff if the if the re refresh rate is higher comparative to whether I'm over 60 FERPs or not. I mean, or 60 frames per second. Um, so I, I myself would look at it this way. I really do think when it comes to VR itself, we need to focus more on, as you say, refresh rate over frames per second but we need to hold at least 60 frames per second. So 60 should be bare minimum on the frames per second, and we should do at least 120, so double the frames per second. So if, if we're doing 120 frames per second, we need a 240 refresh rate. In my personal opinion, should always be the refresh rate should always be double your frames. Uh, because I am running into an issue where my frames and my refresh rate are getting really close, where I can get a good 60, and then if I'm sitting at 60 hertz, so I'm, I don't know, I'm really at that point where, eh, plus, you know, a higher refresh rate monitor is not as expensive as it used to be, so, and, and considering I'm staying at 1920, it goes the same thing with a headset, 90, I don't think 90 hertz is enough, um, but that's my opinion, uh, I don't know enough about it, I have played with VR only, in the commodity cell phone thing because I have a Nexus 6 and that's the only kind of VR I've played with and I have a, a you know a 3D little box thing and you know so I've only played with that kind of 3D it's really cool um, it's fun to play with I can only do it for about 20 minutes and then I feel kind of woozy so I don't know maybe maybe you're right maybe it, it needs to be a higher uh, refresh rate. I think we, we maybe we're still in the same thing that we were dealing with when we had CRT monitors where the higher the CRT monitor refresh rate, the better the CRT was, the, the, the better you were because I think I think 75 hertz was, was this, the, was the refresh rate on my last CRT monitor. Maybe it was higher than that, I don't remember. I think it was 75 though. Um, yeah, I, I definitely ran 75 on all of my CRTs. Right, and I think it was a Trinitron, or it was a ViewSonic. I had a Trinitron and a ViewSonic. They were both 21 inches. Uh, one of them was a 27 inch. It was silver and black. It was the ViewSonic, yeah. 75. Uh, it did 1900 by 1600. I think. Wow. Over VGA, I assume. No, it supported DVI. Oh. It was a first generation DVI. I remember that one. Yeah, because I had to convert it in the back. So it wasn't bad. I mean, it did really good. It was a flat. It was one of those really flat ones. Like on the front face, it was flat on the screen. I think I had that monitor. Um, I had that monitor till somebody uh, accidentally dropped it because this stupid thing weighed a million pounds. No joke. It weighed so much weight. Um, it was a, it basically if I wanted to get an exercise, I just picked it up and moved it in my office. Um, if I needed to do some crunches or I needed some exercise, I just pick it up and move it. And I mean, literally, you would have to like do this huge thing. You'd have to grab it and lift. 
it was it was huge. Yeah. So you you mentioned uh, a similar uh, issue to what I uh, said. If you get too close to it, do you notice that kind of uh, like juddery, not smooth feeling when uh, you get close to a monitor? Um, well, considering that I, I basically set mine up in a specific way, like, um, so I try to do everything I can to customize my system so that I don't have that problem. Um, but I don't really have an issue unless I'm like so close to the monitor. If I'm having to read really tiny text and I have to get really close to the monitor that I maybe notice things. But usually for me, it's pixelization in movies and stuff. And the farther I'm away from the monitor, the better it is. Because I just, my eyes aren't as good. So, you know, I could watch a 480 movie. A movie at 480 at, you know, three foot away. And I'm not going to see the difference because of my eyes as if the movie was in 720 or 1080. I'm not going to see the difference because my eyes aren't going to be able to tell the difference. Because my eyes aren't that good. Um, but if I'm sitting, like, a foot away from my desk that I'm going to be able to tell the difference between a 480 movie, a 720 movie, and a 1080 movie. I'm going to be able to tell the difference. Uh, only because I'm a foot away from my desk, my eyesight, you know, I have my glasses are compensating enough that... But, to be honest with you, I don't see the difference uh, between 60 hertz. I do see the difference between 60 and 120, and I have seen the difference between 120 and 240. And uh, my preferred is 120 or 165. Basically, that's my preferred. 240 is too much. And 60, I'm starting to get to the point to where 60 isn't enough. So. Now, uh, it, when you say 120 and 240, are you talking about the refresh rates used by televisions? Yeah. Yeah, I'm talking about televisions. I'm not talking about monitors. <laughs> Well, technically, mo televisions are monitors, but that's a whole other can of terms. But yeah, um, but that's what I'm talking about. If because that's all I've experienced. I've never experienced an actual physical monitor, like a computer monitor, that's a higher refresh rate. Other than, say, for example, a CRT. But an actual monitor, TVs are the only ones that I've interacted with that are a different things. Because I, I mean, I have a Sony that. That's 120s, so, or it's 100 and something. I don't know. That's a Sony mo mo uh, TV, 40 inch, um, and it works great. And I wouldn't know the difference. I wouldn't know the difference between. I, and I actually do. That's a problem I deal with. That at a certain distance, I can't even tell the difference between the 40 inch 61 versus the 100 series one, the 100 and whatever. I'd have to go look. I don't know what it even the specs are on this stupid thing. It was cheap. I got it on Black Friday. It's whatever. So the there's actually a, a reason why the 120 hertz um, uh, televisions make sense. And uh, for anyone out there in the audience who might not know this, most films are filmed in 24 frames a second. That has changed lately, and some films are doing 45 or 48 something. They should be doing 60, but, you know, whatever. They're doing like 48. And when you try to watch a 24 frame per second movie on a 60 hertz television, it has to do what is called a 3-2 pull-down. It will show this frame for three refresh cycles. It'll show the next frame for two refresh cycles. 3 2, 3 2, 3 2. And that does create judder. And uh, you can definitely see that as a, a system mentioned. When you bump the refresh rate up of the uh, television up to 120, you have a more even division there because 24 divides into 120 five times. So you end up just showing the same frame on screen for five frames at a time or five refresh cycles at a time, and that makes it feel a lot smoother than it would otherwise. It you know, makes it feel more like you would see it 
on a projector in, in a movie theater. And 240 really doesn't make sense. Just because. Unless you're watching 48 frame per second content, because I don't think that 48 divides into 120 correctly. And so you come back to the same exact problem. Yeah, uh, but, t- but 240, and it's 244. Um, 240. Oh, that, just, that just screws everybody up. Well, that's what it is. That That's the standard, is 244, I think, not 240, but it's like 244 or something. But they just call it 240 or something. I don't know. Anyway, um, but it makes sense, like, if it was every 10, every, so you'd have a frame every, so you'd have a refresh rate of a frame every 10 instead of every 5, it's 10 now. So, so that would even be smoother at 24. So I, I could see that, like, especially if you had a Blu-ray movie that's in very high resolution on a screen at 240 at every 10, then you would have no stutter at all. Because I'd have to scan the... Anyway, I don't, I, don't, I don't know enough about it, to be honest with you. Um, I just know that 120 looks pretty to me, 240 is overkill, and uh, it feels... I don't know, when I watch two, 240 or 244 or whatever, it feels muddy. I don't know how to explain that. Like, it just feels muddy. That, that could just be the uh, display technology they're using, because... If you try driving a panel too fast, it will actually generate more motion blur. Like if the panel is designed for 60 and you try to, and you somehow manage to drive it at 240, the blur is unbelievable. And if you don't have a very high quality panel. So it might be that they're just putting in 120 panels, or panels that would work well at 120, Overdriving them to 240, and yeah, no. Uh, as I said, I don't know enough. As I said, I would be giving uh, when we started. It's all about commentary for me. I, I, I don't claim to know anything when it comes to that. Like that's this is outside of my wheelhouse. This is other than this is what I have dealt with. This is what I feel. This is what I see. This is what I smell. And that's my opinion. And sometimes it doesn't smell so good. Um, but that, but that's the commentary for me. It's the I don't I don't know. Uh, VR is intriguing to me, but I feel like we've been dealing with the same quote unquote headset technology forever since the '80s. It looks like the same technology that I saw um, that was being demoed in the '80s. Same headset. Virtual boy. I mean, yeah, it looks like a Virtual Boy. It but it's but it's better graphically. I mean, when okay, this this is the event. This is where I think we're getting to the point where it's good. It's awesome. Is when cell phones are self-contained computers that have absolutely everything you need for virtual reality. That is the awesome part. That's where I think when cell phones are at the point where there's where they have the appropriate refresh rate of 120 hertz at least where they can do 60 FERPs to... And this is where Vulcan... And it, now I'm going to bring Vulcan back into this. This is where Vulcan's going to come in handy. This is... I can see where I can see where Google is going with this. And, and this goes back to the point of this. Okay, so... This is my tinfoil hat. I'm putting my tinfoil hat on. All right, I'm putting my tinfoil hat on my rumor meal. I really have this really weird feeling that Apple is going to jump in this stupid game. They're getting into this thing. I don't know where they're going to make it because they're not they're not making good money right now. They're well, they are making good money, but they're not really making the money they used to be making, right? And if they can commandeer their iPhones into headsets, just like Google is doing with the Android uh, virtualization and all the Android stuff that they're doing, if Apple can do the same thing, I really think we're going to have a run for the money on the Oculus Rift and. The, the vibe. I think they're going to have a real major run for their money, and they're, I, I don't think they're going to be able to hold on to their pants. Um, that's just my opinion. Again, tinfoil hat, my opinion. Don't take this as fact. 
This is me just telling you what I think, prospectively, could happen. And at that point, I think all of the caveats that we, we have the issues with of it not being the refresh rate that we think it should be and all of that, I think all of that will just become a thing. And then you will have mainstream VRs. Then you won't have these uh, video game dens in uh, in certain countries where people are dying at their keyboard. No, no, people will just die at their house now instead of going to a video game den to play video games forty, uh, you know, twenty four hours a day, seven days a week, and they forget to eat. Now, now we're going to have VR to do that again. Tinfoil hat, totally going into the you know dystopic future kind of thing. But you know me. I think everybody's crazy, so you know how it is. Yeah, I am crazy. <laughs> so I I haven't seen a VR uh, demo on a phone. I haven't really tried, but I did see one of the 3D videos on YouTube on my phone. That was that was pretty interesting. Oh man, it's actually a 3D ad. <laughs> yeah, the uh, um. So I I have a racing game that I can do in 3D. And it's awesome. It uses Vulcan. Um, and, and people that say that there are not games on uh, on Android or whatever that are Vulcan supported and all that, just because the internet doesn't say that they're there doesn't mean they don't exist. It just means you're too stupid to go find it. <laughs> just saying. Um, but no, there's there's two racing games and a uh, and a, and an RTS that are Vulcan supported. Well, one of the racing games is a VR game, and it uses Vulkan. You have to enable it. You have to go in and enable the Vulkan. Um, I'm running Android in, so I have Vulkan, direct Vulkan support on my Nexus 6, and so I just had to go in. I had to enable it, and then I put it in my little box, which I've probably packed up because I'm moving. Um, I don't know what I did with it, or I'd show you guys right now. Um, but it, it, it's just a cardboard thing. That I, I downloaded instructions off the internet, and I got three pizza boxes, and I ordered this, like, for $25. I ordered the components I needed to make it work. And then I made it out of cardboard box, or pizza boxes, but whatever. And anyway, so you just put it up to your face, and uh, I'm lazy, so I got, uh, I got um, elastic wrap stuff and staple gun, and I stapled it so I could stick it on my face. It's not really super comfortable, but it works. And then I can just put my Nexus 6 in there, and I can move my head around and, and do all this stuff up and down. And um, the only things I'm having issues with the magnets not working exactly 100%. Sometimes it glitches, but whatever. But it's really cool. Um, what I'm really wanting to be able to do is maybe have, like, a, I mean, what I think would be really, really cool would be have Bluetooth accessories that you can just attach to the phone. Because Bluetooth is already there. It's a thing on your phone. Uh, if you have a current gen or a close to current gen phone or a phone that's at least two years old, you've got Bluetooth. It's a thing. Um, and you could have controls. Just like anything else. I just, I think it's a thing and it's going to be more of a thing. And with Android in, it's just going to get better. And if Apple gets in the game, it's just going to get better. And then we're going to have this whole compete between, uh, property that is owned solely by individual companies and then property that is individually eyes like android and is created and technically people are like well google owns it but to be honest with you it's an open platform as open as you can get it to be open <laughs> besides linux and then and, and then that goes into more to the point of that when people figure out how to get Vulkan to work on linux stuff then we might have hardware that's linux that's directly linux because it's just a computer that you attach to your face. And I have no idea where I went with this. I just went... Just off on a tangent. I know. Hopefully it was a good tangent. I don't know. Maybe people learn things. Maybe I'm learning things. I don't But it's just you what I, I... Well, I mean, I really like it. I mean, it's interesting. But as I said, I can only do about 20 minutes of it. And then I start feeling woozy. Um, I don't... Just explain how... What I mean by that is... Uh, if you've ever been in an aircraft that, if you've ever flown on a plane and you've been on an aircraft and you hit turbulent storms and you're in the storm for a little too long and you start feeling like you're wanting to throw up or you've ever been on a boat and the water gets a little turbulent, 
that's what I'm talking about. It's that nauseous feeling. Not like you're actually going to throw up, but just that that moment, that, that moment right before it. Or if you had bad Thai food. But again, you're going to throw up because you had bad Thai food. But the point being, it's that, it's that moment, it's that nauseous feeling. I don't throw up, but I just get there. And sometimes it messes with my eyes, which is kind of weird. But anyway. Yeah, I will say, uh, in my experience, I definitely get that right in the eyes. It makes them feel uncomfortable. So uh, if anyone out there in the audience is uh, experiencing the kind of things that we've uh, we've been describing in this show, it might be time for an upgrade to a higher refresh rate monitor. So as, as far as that goes, if you are unfamiliar with uh, what the market has available right now, once you get above 60, we used to have 120 hertz monitors. Those pretty much went away, and I don't think anybody makes them anymore. The new standard is uh, 144 hertz, and you can find a variety of these at 1080p and at 1440p. Um, if you're into the ultra-wide camp, there is a 2560 by 1080 monitor available from Acer, I believe, that uh, does 200 hertz. Uh, when you get to the 3440 by 1440 ultra-wides, then you are pretty much limited to 100 hertz because of the DisplayPort 1.2 spec. It can't really go beyond that. Um, and once you get up to 4K, you're pretty much locked into 60 hertz right now. So, two years in? No, a year and a half of owning a 4K monitor. Well, UHD 3840 by 2160. I have got to recommend people not getting a UHD monitor for gaming. For productivity, it's fantastic. And you will love having a a UHD desktop to work on. It's made doing this show a lot easier, I've got to tell you. But gaming, not so much. Wait until uh, DisplayPort 1.3. Uh, is it 1.3 or is 1.4 coming out too? Do you, do you know? Again, when it comes to that kind of stuff, it's whatever comes on a graphics card. I have no idea. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I don't really pay attention to that on the on that aspect. I mean, that's really bad for me, and I probably should pay attention to that. Um, but for me, it's I don't know. It's just it's not a factor right now, so it's not something I'm really looking at. As long as it works at nineteen twenty by ten eighty, I really haven't come to a point to care. Um, but yeah, I think one point four is the one that's being next. But I could be incorrect. You should uh, look it up on the Googles, on on the interwebs, because that would be the answer we want to look for then. And right as I Google it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, whichever spec is coming out, DisplayPort 1.3 or 1.4, uh, whichever one is available on the R uh, AMD RX 480 right now, if you can get your hands on one, and it doesn't light your motherboard on fire. Burn, baby, burn! <laughs> yes. Yeah, if it doesn't do that... Um, but that's a thing. Yeah, it is. Uh, don't buy an RX 480 right now, and if you do, definitely don't overclock it. Just, and don't uh, put it on old hardware. Yeah. Yeah, don't put it on a motherboard over three years old. At all. Ever. Because... Uh, there are issues. There are issues. Um, but yeah, um, so on that note, if we're going to have a discussion about that, I don't care if there's a power problem. <laughs> it's a $200 graphics card. Um, yeah, that's like, oh, that's like, that's like complaining if I buy a toaster from China and it explodes. It cost me like five dollars because it was made in China. I don't care. It's the same thing. It's like a it's a two hundred dollar graphics card. That's that, why you should have bought the ten dollar uh, Chinese uh, toaster. 
Yeah, see, that's the problem. I should have bought the ten dollar. But if you're gonna buy the ten dollar toaster, you might as buy uh, might as well buy a nine nine seventy. I mean, that's the point, it, or a ten sixty. So if you're gonna buy the more expensive toaster, might as well buy the more expensive toaster, and don't complain about the crap you have to deal with with the cheaper toaster. Okay, there's a one in four chance that the cheaper toaster is gonna explode. One in four chance. Get the hell over it. It's okay. Okay? Um, if you're going to buy the cheaper card, you should know that there are caveats. Caveats happen. It's whatever. I mean, this isn't... Oh, my God. People are like, oh, my God, but it's not a... Okay, fine. Okay. What about the incident with the graphics card that only had 3.5 gigs of RAM? What about the, the issue with the NVIDIA cards that you have the same graphics card repeated twice, but yet it's in two different generations... And there is a three hundred dollar uh, price point difference. Really? That that's the retardedness. That's back in the two hundred series of the Nvidia cards. And if, if you know what I'm talking about, then you'll know. You know, whatever. It was basically the same stupid graphics card, but they reissued it and made it three hundred dollars more because they did some stuff to it. It's like really, whatever, whatever. Anyway, shit happens. Oh well, AMD tried something; it didn't work. Yeah. So, I think the takeaway from this is, go buy a high refresh rate monitor. And don't buy it. Okay, buy a high refresh monitor. Don't buy a 480 right now, and fuck AMD. And that's coming from an AMD fanboy, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, because uh, I'm just not really happy right now with them. Yeah. And it has nothing to do with the 480. There's this whole other conversation I've been having about the open AMD drivers and the uh, 15.7 drivers and the fact that they're like, oh my god, it's supposed to be better and there's supposed to be all these things and things are supposed to work great. No, it's the same. Actually, some games actually work worse, which is retarded. And then I'm only limited to a certain amount of cards that are supported with that driver which pisses me off. Uh, it's like, okay, I can't upgrade Linux. I can't upgrade my Linux because this, this, and this won't work. But at the same time, if I do upgrade Linux and I can't use Steam, if, if I have this graphics card below the R9 series. So I have to buy the more expensive AMD card, which isn't even going to give me the performance I want. So I'm better off buying an NVIDIA card to get the performance I want. But the open AMD driver is crap still. <sighs> Luckily for me, I need them for other things, and, it, and gaming is not my thing, or we would have a completely different discussion, and I would literally be... If I didn't need them for something else that has nothing to do with whether they're NVIDIA or AMD, I just need raw horsepower for other things, like OpenCL, um, and NVIDIA sucks at it, and anybody that tells me differently, I will pit any card, including a Titan, up against my AMD cards, and I will tell you that OpenCL is not as good on NVIDIA cards, only just because of the way that they design them. But that's a whole other can of worms. Um, that's why they use AMD stuff in Xbox and PlayStations, but, but that's a whole other can of worms. The point that I'm saying is, I'm upset. You need to get your crap fixed, AMD. You need to stop pulling this crap. And you're promising more than you're actually delivering. Stop it. Just make nice crap, please. Like you did with the 64-bit processors. Like you did with the dual-core processors back in the day when Intel didn't have that crap. Just build nice stuff. Do your job. Make something worth buying. And I will buy it. I will still buy it even if it's crap, but that's not the point. Just don't blow up my computer, okay? <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, that's 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 my caveat. Uh, but yeah, but you are AMD right now. You are forcing me to have to buy Nvidia, whether I like it or not, because of some issues. Yeah, and I'll echo that statement. If uh, if AMD comes out with good stuff, I'll buy it. I want stuff that. Uh, that will burn up Intel and NVIDIA. Not, not, not burn it up like catch fire to it, but 
you know. Okay, well, on a side note, okay, so we're back to this conversation. Okay, so I've been looking at the 67K. I like the fact that it doesn't have the, uh, I like that it's a consumer grade and, and the fact, and, it, and it's a pretty processor, and it's really, at its price point now, it's getting to the point to where I'm like, hmm, I might want to pick that up. Um, because its price point is at a point where it's it's worth it to me, and at the same time, I, I'm looking at it. It doesn't have that horrible thing I don't like about uh, the the V Pro. You know, I yeah. don't really want that, and so it doesn't have that, which is nice for me. I like that. Well, you know, it's totally integrated in the chip anyway. Oh yeah, we know. Well, technically, we already know what's there, but it's not quote unquote there. Okay, it's not supposed to be there. It's it's not off. there for you, it's there for the NSA. Yeah, that's true. So that's where I'm debating on that. It's like, really? I really am looking at that chip. It's good in a price point. I, I found a couple of motherboards that I really like, that are priced at a good at a, a good price point, uh, that I really want to do. It's DDR4, and because I'm really concerned AMD is just not going to bring what I want to the to the table. I really, if if the 480 is being an example here, I'm really concerned that the AMD chips, CPUs, are not going to be at the table where I want them to be. And I really don't want to go APU. And and that's the biggest thing for me, is that I I want good performance, because I I do have my, my things and my caveats, the things I would like, and I really don't want to have to go there. But at the price point, at the price point of the motherboard... I'm really looking at it going, hmm, I don't know. I'm debating. And it doesn't have VPro, quote-unquote, on it, so I'm debating really hard. I don't know. What's your opinion, Atomic? Yeah, I'm just waiting for Zen to come out to make any any uh, decisions on that regard. But I did make uh, one decision. After I saw the news that uh, old Xeons were dirt cheap, I went ahead and b uh, built a dual Xeon system. Now, this has got two E52670s, which are 8-core hyper-threaded parts clocked at 2.6 with a 3.3 .3 turbo. And... They each have the performance of my i7 4790K. So in one system, I have double the power of my previous system. But the true question is, did it set you back the same amount of money? Oh, no, no. If we add up all the stuff that I've bought for this uh, 4790K rig, I'm in for like five or 6000 that includes a monitor, so so um, these these monitors are going to be used on the the uh, Xeon system as well. So, but uh, I think I'm in about seven hundred dollars on this uh, this system as it stands right now. Okay. But okay. Anyway, I think we've talked this subject to death. So. We aren't even talking about VR anymore. We're talking about... No, we're not. Uh, <laughs> we're, that's we're the just point. Rambling. So we're not rambling. We're discussing other items that are important to us. Like, I really want you to go in-depth more on this Xeon thing that you're working on, because I find it very interesting, and I think everybody else would find it interesting, too. Well, I, uh, I booted it up last night just for a brief period of time because I was stealing the RAM from my current system and I need 32 gigs. And I don't have a, a case currently to put that in, so I don't really want to just have it sitting running on on my desk at the moment. Can you, can you explain to us why you had issues with the case? Because you bought one. Can you tell us why you're having issues with the case? Okay, the case itself claimed to support EATX. I'm not so sh certain of that because uh, it's got holes in the right place for EATX. Not all of them are threaded for the uh, actual motherboard standoffs. So, and 
so that you don't make the same mistake I did, it's the DIY PC Silence. Yeah, don't buy that one. But uh, I'm going to make it work. The other part of the problem was the motherboard I chose was a Super Micro motherboard. And as near as I can figure out, it's just not adhering to the EATX standard, even though it claims to be an EATX on the Supermicro uh, website. So, if, you, if you're in the market for a multiprocessor system, and you buy a Supermicro motherboard, be prepared to modify the case. That's just a thing. So, yeah. So, are you planning on acquiring another case specifically instead of using the DIY, or...? No. Uh, the DIY, th that's my biggest complaint, is, is the uh, location for the uh, standoffs. The, the holes and the threading for the standoffs. Otherwise, the case is reasonable, reasonably uh, quality. The, the, uh, it, it was a windowed case because that ended up being cheaper and uh, the window on my case for the i7 4790k rig it uh, it had a window too and it came broken thanks UPS but uh, the DIY case came with uh, its window intact so that's that's a mark in its favor <laughs> yeah. Well, so we go to the oh, okay. So if you could go back and, and change it, you would probably, I guess, order a different case if, ahead of time if you knew that that was a thing. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so it it would probably be something else that you would probably specifically have that would be more, I, I assume, efficient. But when I was looking. I, when it comes to ETATX and ATX and all that, it really matters where the I.O. is. That defines whether it's an ETATX or an ISS or whatever version of, of motherboard design that it is. That's actually what's de defining it, is where the I.O. location is. Not so much the holes, because I think you and I had a conversation back and forth, is that for certain versions of the E. Uh, BB boards and the or is it EEB boards and the EEC boards? Um, they have a row of of uh, standoffs that are different than a, an EATX or uh, or anything of that nature. And it's where the I/O location is on the case that diver usually differentiates uh, the differences. With your motherboard, the I/O is in the correct spot. But there's a standoff that's a little bit farther back, and on your case there should be a another standoff that's closer to the end of the case, so that you have a direct uh, line uh, on the case where the motherboard can be mounted, basically flush. Instead of on the other ATX cases, the reason that they push it back a little bit is because in the old days you had uh, like full size mouse connectors or keyboard connectors that were very in the very end at the very top and now they've basically pushed them down a little bit where you don't have it as much hey yen froze yeah did uh, you did catch my audio i was yeah. still here like i was still talking yeah, yeah. on my end i was still having video yeah your audio never stopped but okay. uh, I will show the, the motherboard again, and I'll, I'll give you an idea of where my problem is. Now, the, uh, the hole you mentioned, the one where the PS2 port would go, that one is out of place. Um, in the ATX uh, spec, that hole is actually set back about where the, uh, where the uh, memory slot begins. Mm-hmm. And this is where the PS2 port would be if the uh, motherboard were arranged. Uh, For a standard ATX. Right. I'm holding the thing up as it would be in a tower. Can I get it in the shot? 
probably reversed on stream, I'm not certain. But, uh, yeah, that one is off. Now, the two down in the uh, PCIe section, those line up perfectly. But uh, the mid-row that goes through here does not line up. And the, the end row where your drive cage would start, that's where I have holes that aren't threaded. So that's where my problem stands. Okay, so they did they did put holes there, and they just didn't thread them correctly. And it's probably has to do with crappy tapping. So like, it's probably when they uh, when they make these holes for for the uh, standoffs in the uh, cases when they make them out of you know just cheap sheet steel, they punch the hole rather than drill it, so that you have that little uh, flange of material. Uh, left there that you can actually thread. Well, the holes that are out towards the drive cages, they're there, but they're drilled so you don't have a flange to actually put any threading in. So, can't do anything with it. So, I'm going to be working on this tomorrow. I hope. I'm going to try to uh, drill out the correct holes and then see if I can find some nuts that'll work on uh, the standoffs. Okay. Crossing fingers. Yeah, definitely crossing fingers on that. Uh, the other thing that you can do is the one in the very top corner, because you already have the one that's partially down about halfway, basically at the base, since you have that hole that lines up, yeah? Uh, which which one are you talking about? Uh, the hole, so you, you would have two holes. You'd have a hole at the top, that's usually a little bit farther out, and then you have a hole that's actually lined up equal with your, uh, uh, just right before your PCI Express and all that starts, you'll have another hole. Is that one actually line up? Okay, so uh, the two holes on the on either end of the PCIe slots, mm -hmm. one at the bottom and one in the mid middle of the board, those two line up. Okay. It's the one at the top of the I.O. that... So, uh, your option there is to get those plastic standoffs I was telling you about. And uh, instead of trying to drill in that very far corner and having a chance of it not lining up, just get one of those plastic standoffs. And then uh, get some steel to plastic adhesive stuff, that the glue stuff, and just glue it to it. <laughs> and then that way it won't move. And you don't have to worry about grounding it out or anything. And that'll solve that issue. It's the same thing if you're having modification issues on the other end. But you want to have at least, I think it's, really, you only have to have five that mount. That's it. Well, as heavy as the uh, heat sinks are, and yet given that there are two of them, I'm leaning towards wanting as many as I can get. Well, no, 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 I understand with that. That's not the discussion. That's the reason that the EE boards and the EEC boards have three holes that make an L in the center on those boards. The reason they were designed that way is because of all the extra weight that comes off of the, uh, uh, from the heat sinks and stuff. You know, because, you know, you're putting two giant tits in there, basically, with fans on them. So, you know, they gotta, they gotta... The extra weight is the whole thing, you know? Yep. Yep. Well, I think that's about enough show for tonight. <laughs> I ended it with the giant tits, right? Yep. Uh, it shows with the, the giant tits. <laughs> that's what we should title the show. The one yeah. with the giant tits. Um, <laughs> v oh, that's, that's it. The one with the giant VR tits. That's that will be so clickbaity. It'll be awesome. Uh, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of Cyrus skits for not being here. <laughs> he does get that. <laughs> uh, anyway, if you you're checking us out live, uh, go check us out at LinuxTechAndGaming.com. Uh, click the about link, and you can find all of our social medias. Um, our personal social medias and, and the show's social medias and 
whatever else. You can also uh, find all of my social medias at uh, player.me slash theatomicass. And he doesn't have anything on his player.me except his site. Because I don't, I don't social media other than Twitter. So if you if you want to holler at me, make fun of me, talk about big tits, just message me over on Twitter. Yeah. Okay. See you later, everybody.